we not only live in terms of our past experience and in terms of our current, current circumstances, we also live in terms of what we expect to happen in the future. I've often admonished our audiences that in rearing our children, we not only must rear them in terms of current circumstances or past circumstances, we must rear them in terms of the future. And it is very important that we have a view of the future and a, a, a long-term view of the future. When we look at our present circumstances as African people, and when we look down the road at the future, we should quickly recognize that the tasks of the African child are not the same as the tasks of the European child. And this, this, is, this is a very important per, uh, percept and it, it is hooked into education and into so many other things. Because we often hear black parents say, I want my children to have the same education as the white children. And of course, I, I rail mightily against these archaic concepts, such as same education. We must get rid of that concept. Equal education is another concept that we should uh, get rid of. They are destroying our minds and our ability to form a true education for our children. I've often indicated, I've often indicated there's, there's no such thing as a standard education. To a very great extent, the kind of troubles we see our children in today are the result of the fact that we have accepted European words and definitions and seek to operate within the confines of those definitions. This, of course, is one of the major means by which war is made against the African mind. I've urged black professionals to take up the banner and take up the war of redefinition that as long as we operate within the definitions of Europeans, that we will be subject to their determination of our behavior. I've talked often about European constants. That is, certain European programs that have not changed since we first met the European and which are not intended to change. That the superficial changes that we are now experiencing are only brought into being to maintain the constancies. That we must develop the ability to look beyond the superficial changes and see the constancies being maintained by those changes. We are getting ready to elect an African mayor of this city. But beware, this change is still another version of neo-colonialism. Its intention is ultimately to put a black face on white power. You must recognize the intention ultimately for the European is not to give up his power. He may even force integration upon his people. He may even elect our people to offices and so forth, because in the good old neo-colonialist fashion, these people elected to offices are, are a means by which the ultimate economic, political, social, and other controls are maintained. So we must not see these changes as substantial and basic changes. I'm not advising you not to vote and not to put uh, our African into office, but let us not be deceived. During this Black History Month, I often advise our people that while it is good and wonderful and fitting to celebrate our heroes and to celebrate great events in our past, 
we must also use this time to meditate upon the lessons taught by those events and by those heroes. It will do us very little good to build up a pride as a result of looking at these heroes and as a result of looking at our great accomplishments if we truly do not learn the lessons of those events and accomplishments. We must recognize that in a way we are now undergoing a second reconstruction period. That this is not the first time we have been down this road in America. Those of you, of course, who read Lerone Bennett's Black Power USA are familiar with that fact. I've often noted how Bennett did not finish that book. Of course, he then talked about what? Black mayors, black lieutenant governors, black legislators, black voting power, black corporate leaders, black men in the Senate, black men in the Congress. And yet, in the 1870s, when Andrew Johnson changed his program, when the Supreme Court changed its program, our people were disenfranchised, and it took us 100 years to get back to the same point that we were at then. Which means then that a people who can give are people who can take. And simply, and simply because we may be voting in a black mayor doesn't say that this is going to go on forever and ever. We voted him in before. And because we did not change the basic power relationship between ourselves and the Europeans, we were disenfranchised. In this context, I often warn that we are not protected by laws. We are not protected by courts. We are not protected by presidential mandates. They are but words on paper. Words cannot protect your interests. The law is only as strong as those who enforce it. And the laws that now so-called protect us are written by our enemies and enforced by our enemies. And the day that they decide that they will not enforce them, the law will be null and void, and they will remain neutral on the books. So that the ultimate thing then is not laws, not civil rights laws and rules, not fair housing laws and rules. I've told you again and again that if, there, if one day the European has to choose between feeding his child and your child, I don't give a damn what law is on the books. He's going to feed his first. And you may cite laws and rules, but the reality will be the one with the most power is going to be the one that rules under those circumstances. So that the ultimate goal for African people then is not the placing of laws on books, nor even the election of mayors and governors, but ultimately the building of power so that we can prevent those who would wish to destroy us from doing so, regardless of the laws they may write, regardless of the laws they may enforce or not enforce. So when we look at the mind then as a teleological instrument, as determined by its teleological uh, perceptions, thank you very much. And again, I'm saying teleological is just one big word for future. It's hooked into our word telephone, which means distance, just distance. That's all we're talking about here. We look and we see the condition of African people today. On the bottom, as Garvey noted so many years ago, everywhere he went, the African man, the black man, is on the bottom of the economic, social, and political ladder. Those circumstances have not changed. In many instances, they are getting worse. We will find, if you go to Barnes and Nobles and some of the others, numbers of books asking, can the African survive our very survival into the next century is in question. I often note 
that our children looked at the series Star Wars. And I noticed that in the beginning of that series, there were no black people in the movie at all. And I noted that whenever then the European looks into the future, there is not a black man there. They had animals, robots, and everything else, operating rocket ships and so forth, but not a black man was there. Which means then, ladies and gentlemen, those who think that they're in control of creating the future do not see the African man there at all. This means then ultimately, if we look at the task that our children must perform, that the basic task of the European child is conservative. To conserve and maintain the advantages that the European already has. And to enhance those advantages. So that means they're rearing in their homes, in their communities, that means their education then is basically conservative because since they already have the advantage, they seek then to maintain that advantage. When we then look at the African child, we see a very different future. And I've often said then that future is revolutionary given the condition that our people are in today, our education cannot be then conservative. If we are to save our people from starvation, if we are to remove our people from the bottom of economic, political, and social ladders, then we must overturn the current orders of the world. That in and of itself makes it very clear that they cannot receive the same education as the white child. They cannot be, they cannot be reared the same way the white child is reared because they have very, very different tasks to perform. It is when we recognize then the future task that our children must perform and when we reflect on that task, we then use those future uh, tasks and knowledge of those future tasks to reorganize our present circumstances, to reorganize the schools, to reorganize our relations one to the other, to reorganize our perception of ourselves, and yea, even to reorganize our history, because history is alive and history is present. As I pointed out in Newark of last week, history is the present and history is the future. In European systems, we have a linear approach to the world, an approach that makes one believe that history is something that is left behind. History is something that can be forgotten. No, ladies and gentlemen, history is never left behind. In the human mind, the history is now, and in the human mind, the history is present. For the future is made of things that were made in the past. Without past, there is no future. And so we must then, we must then see. So the, the Afrocentric view of the world is nonlinear. It is one that sees past present and future as simultaneous. And we must recognize this factor. Our knowledge of our history and our perception of our history is intimately tied up with our knowledge of our future and our ability to determine that future. To forget history and not to operate on history is not to control the future. <laughs>